I'm afraid we're living in a very, very tense, uh, difficult uh, geopolitical backdrop. I mean, that's just the reality of it. We've got threats from all around us. Uh, we've got a, a war going on in the Middle East, which we just uh, discussed. We've got an ongoing war in Ukraine, uh, which started um, a couple of years ago now. We've also got uh, increasing tensions uh, uh, in China uh, with Taiwan, uh, also ongoing problems with Russia and an increasingly belligerent Iran. So we are facing a totally different backdrop to what we have been used to uh, in the post-Cold War era. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting because there is a piece out uh, in The Telegraph today and there's a piece by James Heapy, who was um, a defence minister who resigned from the government just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and uh, he says a number of things, but uh, one of the pieces um, that talks about it, that talks about his piece, says this, UK has failed to prepare itself for war warn uh, former defence ministers, not just James Heapy, but also Ben Wallace, the former defence secretary. Now, it says this, Britain has failed to prepare itself for war as a whole nation endeavour, former defence ministers have warned, in a start wake-up call to the government. James Heapy, the former armed forces minister, has revealed that only Whitehall officials from the Ministry of Defence bothered to take part in an exercise to find out how the country would be governed from the UK's wartime bunker. Two weeks after leaving office, the Tory MP and former army officer urged ministers to prepare for conflict. He called on them to put plans in place for commandeering land, for cultivation to feed the nation and requisitioning com consumer electronics for weapons. His comments were backed up by Ben Wallace, the former defence secretary, who said that there were too many people in the government relying on hoping that the current instability would go away. Uh, Mr Wallace, who led the MOD until August last year, said it was time, and I quote, to blow the dust off uh, manuals drawn up in the Cold War on how Britain uh, would be run during wartime. Now, the criticism comes as the government uh, is belatedly reviewing its contingency plans for an all-out war against the backdrop of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing conflict uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, but it's very interesting because uh, Grant Shapps has also been saying that we are living in a pre-war age only a few weeks ago. And uh, Mr. Heapy, who I just uh, mentioned, uh, warned that Britain's preparedness did not match the scale of the threat, adding, and I quote, war is a whole nation endeavour. And to be frank, the UK, uh, in the UK, we are very long way behind. Um, now, it is an election year. It is an election year. And I think it's all too easy for us to sit back as armchair generals and just say, well, this is all the government uh, for the government to deal with. Um, we know that the government has finite resources and we are all electors. We're going to have votes uh, at some point. It might be October, November, uh, but it might be sooner if Richie Sunak uh, can't control uh, the increasingly fractious rebels on his back benches who might want to topple him before. So we could have an election at some point and we are going to have one in the coming months. We know that. And given that backdrop, I want to understand from you, as a voter, how much of a priority is war preparedness for you? How much of a priority is war preparedness for you? 0345 6060973. You can text on 84850 or ask Alexa to send a comment to LBC. I'll give you my thoughts on this in a moment. But I'm asking you this because it's too easy for us to sit back and just say, oh, it's all the government's responsibility. It's not really. If you think it's an important issue, I think that the uh, politicians would respond and elevate it up the political agenda. So I want to hear your thoughts uh, on this. Get your calls in uh, now. Now, joining me to discuss this is General Sir Richard Barons, a former senior British Army officer who has previously served as one of the six chiefs of staff leading the armed forces between 2013 and 2016. A very good afternoon to you, uh, General Sir Richard. Um, uh, what do you make of uh, James Heapy coming out and saying that... Uh, uh, Britain is not really ready for war. The ministers couldn't even really turn up to an exercise to test the bunker. Well, I'm I'm delighted he's saying it. I'm delighted that Ben Wallace, his former boss, says it as well. And 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 it is so that uh, the United Kingdom, not just in the government as but across civil society and, and industry, hasn't had to think about the business of of a war that would touch on our on our survival, on our security, and our prosperity, and our values since the end of the Cold War, which is. 1990, so well beyond the, the memory of of, uh, of many, and the fact that we have now arrived back in circumstances where we have to deal with that kind of threat is not something we asked for. 
it's going to be very difficult because our economy is um, not, not thriving. We want to spend our money on other things. And frankly, you've no experience of dealing with this kind of thing in, in government or across the civil service or indeed parts of the armed forces. But we're still going to have to deal with it or we risk some potentially terrible outcomes. Now, uh, James Heapy mentions uh, in his piece that when he went to uh, uh, Sweden, I think it was, uh, that uh, over there, uh, the uh, his opposite number showed him a leaflet that they actually give people to prepare for war in terms of what you need to buy, the kind of uh, goods you need to do, basic precautions you need to take. If this is going to be a whole country endeavour, um, what, General Sir Richard, do you think we need to be doing? Because it's not just about money, spending more money on defence, that's part of it. But it's also about educating people about the th- risk threat and actually inculcating a sense of preparedness in the nation, which is not an easy thing to do. No, it's difficult and it will take time. And I think the first thing is, if um, everyone listening to this programme took a long, hard look at, at what it feels like to be Ukrainian today, that that's what war for survival feels like and it becomes obvious then it's not just a matter for getting the armed forces right it's about how the whole of society and government and industry bind in behind a a national effort and and to do that would require a program of education and training and resources and what i think is interesting and you described it is those countries that that are next to russia that feel the fear Mm. just out of geography and history rather more they are they are already down this road Mm. and you may have heard Donald Tusk, the new leader of Poland, saying this is the place we need to be just, just last week. And we somehow have not yet taken those steps. Now, what do you make of uh, Jens Stoltenberg? Because obviously uh, the NATO Secretary General, NATO celebrated its 75th anniversary. There was a meeting of the uh, NATO uh, countries, um, uh, defence ministers and other representatives in Brussels uh, only a few days ago, uh, saying that uh, we are the world was now in a much more dangerous, more unpredictable and much more violent place than it has been. And that there is an authority alliance giving each other practical support that is more and more aligned what are your thoughts around this because it's certainly true is it not that we are moving into a much more transactionally driven world there are many non-aligned countries that are not going to ally uh, to the so-called rules-based order that the west promulgates it's a tougher neighborhood out there yes it is and, and we've we've been moving into this space since at least 2014 when russia invaded crimea and one way to look at it is we now live in a world where liberal democracy led by the US, so big question mark over how much the US is going to pay the bill now, but led by the US confronting the autocratic capitalist led by China, but with Russia and and countries like North Korea and Iran definitely in that fold. And then a whole lot of the rest of the world in Africa and Asia, wondering which side to back do they need to back a side? And it's not obvious to them they should back us. That's true. I mean, what do you make of like the threat where you've got people like India, for example, and I saw uh, the uh, Indian foreign minister uh, at uh, the Munich Security Conference just a few weeks ago when he was asked directly by Rula Khalaf at the FT, well, you know, uh, loads of people are putting sanctions on Russia, not buying their oil, but you still are. And he said, well, smart allies offer smart choices and smart people make smart choices, subtext being we'll do exactly what's in our interest. Thank you very much. I mean, you've got India, you've got China now, you've got a detente in some ways between India and China, and you've got uh, uh, export trade going on between Russia and China at 240 billion last year, an increase of 20 percent on the previous year. Yeah, so we so th- this is so, and we have come out of a world where, generally speaking, things went the way we, the West, led by the US, wanted them to go, whether that was security or in terms of our economy. That world is over. We lived in a multipolar world where our voice is going to be less, and the only way that we can protect our interest is first of all to bind with our partners in NATO. There's no affordable solution for the UK outside collective security arrangement and to realise that we essentially have a choice. We either get back to doing deterrence better, which is the most important thing to do, and that means having credible armed forces and societies that are resilient. And it also means that we find a voice with our with our partners about how we want the world to work, or those bigger forces, frankly in Asia, will decide how the world works and our interests will be firmly a secondary consideration. Indeed, uh, a sobering thought. Thank you very much indeed. That was General Sir Richard Barons, former uh, senior British Army officer who was uh, previously uh, served as one of the six chiefs of staff leading the armed forces between 2013 and 2016. 